Now, uh, as I think uh, many of you know, I gave a lecture recently in just last week in Beijing at the University of uh, Beijing. <coughs> it was a very, very well organized, professionally organized lecture, and very well attended, and I'm, I was very pleased with it. <coughs> and uh, there were various scholars, and some of whom were my former students uh, who were invited for the comments and discussions. It's altogether a very inspiring experience for me. And the topic I gave was on Adimokti, <coughs> uh, meditative practice and uh, the doctrine of Vijapti Matrata. That is the doctrine that uh, consciousness or my alone or better, cognition alone exists. Uh, I know some of you might say, yeah, I have heard about, I have heard of this, I have heard about it, and uh, that uh, they, 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 they remember that I gave similar lectures a <coughs> couple of times in uh, Hong Kong. But the lecture I gave in uh, Beijing is uh, much more, I can say, substantial and that I quote a lot of uh, scriptural uh, supports and uh, illustration on the importance of Adi Mukti. And I think I'll make some uh, additional important points also. So today I just want to share a couple of things with you but maybe not probably the, from the academic point of view, the most important uh, among those points I made uh, at the Beijing lecture. But I think some, uh, <coughs> I think, uh, understanding that is very useful for myself and for others uh, uh, with whom I want to share on the whole question of Adimukti. Now, uh, this term Adimukti, sometimes uh, given as Adimoksha, so it's on Gaya. Zhongman yaw kita sun gai, yaw kita sing gai, zhi bi gao gu wa yik la hai yi gai. There are various translations in Chinese. is usually understood not only by ordinary people but even by scholars and even by uh, you know uh, masters uh, who are translating the Sanskrit uh, sentences in ancient time as faith as conviction and uh, just now I had a very quick check online also and I saw that uh, most discussions by scholars refer to this word as faith. So one of the important points I made uh, in my lecture is that it is much more than faith. Much, much more than faith. And, uh, you know, faith is essentially an emotional quality. But then, of course, uh, it raises the question as to the place of faith in Buddhism. Uh, how do we understand faith? Uh, for instance, suddenly, faith in Buddhism is not uh, to be understood, not to be encouraged as blind faith. Huh? Uh, irrational uh, acceptance or adherence. By the way, the word accept, adherence also is used by some modern scholars to translate uh, Adimukti. That's interesting. So anyway, it's not the kind of an irrational, uh, emotional uh, response. In that sense, Buddhism has never encouraged uh, faith uh, as, as blind uh, conviction. <coughs> and suddenly, 
in that sense, uh, also uh, faith is certainly of secondary importance for the Buddhist. But I think uh, many ultra, you know, rational <coughs> exponents of uh, Buddhism, modern exponents, try to show that Buddhism doesn't require faith. That Buddhism is not not primarily a or a religion of faith and so I've talked about it and uh, and some very brilliant scholars use the word confidence which I don't like uh, it doesn't bring out of the, 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 the essential nature of Sadha or Shraddha huh? so I still use the word faith for Shraddha now what I was saying is that although uh, Scholars, many scholars, including ancient ancient masters, have understood Atimukti to be faith. We have to think about in that case, what is the place of faith in Buddhism, in a spiritual practice. And to make it very short, certainly faith is not secondary. Faith is not less important. In fact, in a sense, it is most important. We can't uh, start the spiritual path. We can't progress without faith in the deep sense, and uh, certainly in the sense of atimukti. Today, there's no time to go into the whole question of faith, and uh, I, I have I have uh, remarked on it in other contexts. For instance, I have told you that if you look at the suttas including the Pali Suttas, even especially the Pali Suttas, you find that uh, the description is that someone left the home life not because of uh, some clever, you know, rational, intelligent understanding, but because of uh, faith. The word is Sadda. The Kula Puto, the, the cleansed man, or the son of the good family, as is usually translated, yeah, uh, leaves home life out of faith. Properly, of course, the word sometimes used, uh, out of faith, from home in homelessness. Sadha, agarasma, anankaryam, papachati, or papachito. Papachito is a past participle. Papachati is the third person, present, singular. <coughs> so, this is always the description. Someone, you know, it's a very big thing to leave the home life to, to make a renunciation. It's a, it's, a, it's a commitment for your whole life. Huh? And you do that not because of some intelligent, philosophical understanding you get you know, uh, from listening to a, to, a, to, to a talk by the Buddha or anything like that. But after listening to the Buddha, um, after being near to the Buddha, or after being inspired by the disciples of the Buddha, someone decided, that's it, that's my life, that's my direction, and he left home life. I can say that in my case also, it was, uh, you can say it's like that, uh, that I read many books and Buddhism has always attracted me and, uh, and so on. But when I decided to leave the home life as a, as a young man, it was my deep feeling. So deep that nobody can change my mind. Uh, many of my friends, my, you know, uh, obviously say, no, 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 you wait, you, 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 you wait, you carry on. Uh, Whatever, whatever study you're pursuing and then the, uh, make the decision later. But for me, it was no later. Once I decided on it, it was so strong that I just wanted to leave the home life. Right? So, uh, therefore, I appreciate that sentence, that description in the Pali Sutta very uh, deeply. Hmm? It was faith that determines your whole career, your whole life. And that includes people who are intelligent, not people who are just uh, emotionally fragile. 
And that's extremely interesting. Today you see, of course, many uh, European people also, they become monks and nuns. And certainly many of them, if not all of them, are very intelligent, highly educated. And they have been through all kinds of experiences in life. They have been through uh, various religious traditions and then they, 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 they come to Buddhism and decide to be a monk or a nun. We have seen that. Hmm? I have had students who are like this, European students, for instance. Uh, so as I said, uh, there's, a, there's a big uh, question to be, to be discussed uh, actually at length about the role, of the place of faith in the proper sense, in the Buddhist sense, eh? uh, in our spiritual practice. So as I said, today uh, we don't have time to go into basically uh, deta uh, details uh, uh, on this point. So we come back to the whole question of Adimukti. Okay. Now, uh, although this is usually understood and even nowadays, or in ancient times, translated as faith, as conviction. And I was emphasizing in my lecture that uh, it has very deep uh, aspect of insight, of understanding. That again goes back to the question of faith in Buddhism. Faith is not just a mere, as I already said, a mere you know, blind uh, emotional response. True faith is founded on insight. And a deep insight, if it is deep enough, motivates your heart. And you have the expect of uh, uh, emotional response, and that is faith. So usually I, or at least very often, I translate such a word like faith or kanti or or Shanti in, in Sanskrit as receptivity. That's the first step in a spiritual life. You know, if you don't know how to, if you are not capable of responding from your heart, then there is no hope of you actually, uh, properly speaking, uh, no hope of you uh, uh, for progress, for true commitment. If you, are, if you cannot respond to the fact that there are higher things to achieve, there are higher forms of realities, there are higher states, highest of which is Nibbana, is enlightenment, you know, there are higher possibilities, not to talk about states, but even in terms of potential and possibilities, you know, that there are higher Qualities in, uh, uh, potentialities in you as a human being which you can unfold, you should unfold if you cannot respond to that then you, you don't really start you may be a clever, intelligent uh, debater trying to convince yourself and others huh? clever orator clever lecturer but uh, I believe that you can't say you are truly religious in the true sense. Huh? You can't make any progress. So, to me, the reason why Adi Mukti is emphasized so much in the Sutta, when I, when I look at this whole notion, that is, I feel not enough, not sufficiently discussed in modern times, that's why I talk about it in s several contexts. When I look at the uh, different sources, Pali, you know, Sanskrit, and Chinese, of course, including uh, uh, parallel Tibetan uh, passages, uh, I realize that uh, Atimukti is a very, very important factor, an important psychological factor, and even more, for one or a better term, an important spiritual factor. 
just that it has not been sufficiently discussed in modern times. Uh, now, as to the fact that the term Adi Mukti in Pali is Adi Mutti, or maybe a more uh, commonly occurred term is not Adi Mukti actually in Pali, it's Adi Mukka. They both mean the same basically. And in Sanskrit also you have Adi Mukti and Adi Muksha, both of them uh, being used more or less interchangeably. So in the Pali Suttas also, it is extremely important. Firstly, talking about relationship between uh, faith and uh, Adimukti, I just want to add a little bit more, although I say I can't spend too much time on this. Uh, if you look at the, from the Pali tradition in the uh, very early time, you have the concept of someone who is uh, liberated through faith. Yeah? And uh, now the term usually involved there is uh, besides uh, Sadha, is the clear terms Adi Mutta or Adi Mukti actually. Yeah? So uh, someone can uh, gain liberation by following the path of the Dhamma, understanding. So, uh, it is called a Dhamma Anusari, a pursuant on the doctrine. So he is the more intellectual type, but that doesn't mean that, uh, as I said, uh, he, he can truly uh, embark on the path of progress without the emotional involvement. Uh, the other one is called Sadda Anusari. That's where you see the word Sadda coming in. And someone who, who, who is a pursuant of faith, who enters into the path through faith. Yeah? Now, the important thing is that According to both the early tradition as well as the Mahayana tradition, yoga, including the Yogacara and other Mahayana traditions, uh, subsequently, uh, someone who is uh, liberated in that way is said to be Adimukta, the Sata Adimukta. Is it? Adimukta. Uh, that 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 shows that uh, Adimukti is connected with uh, liberation, the idea of liberation. That's another point. Now, uh, coming back to the importance of uh, Adimukti, another point I emphasized in the lecture is that we have to understand how our personality development, the process of our psychological uh, transformation, as well as spiritual progress, I've said, uh, have to be connected with Adimukti. Without Adimukti, actually, one cannot change. This is comparable to the modern psychological uh, teaching that uh, the understanding that the, the patient cannot change. That is to say, irrespective of how much uh, intellectual understanding or knowledge he, the patient has about himself, about a problem. He cannot, she or she cannot change unless she gain deep insight into that problem. It's not a question of just intellectual understanding. Unless a person becomes truly convinced, or that, 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 that's me, I'm like that, or this is my negative part, you know, or this is my positive part, you know, and uh, unless you come to that stage of uh, 
psychological involvement, which is certainly much more than just a matter of intellectual understanding, you cannot change. All these psychology books, all these doctors' consultation will be just simply a matter of interesting discussion. You begin to change only when you are truly convinced. And that conviction is comparable to the idea of Adimukti or the role of Adimukti in our spiritual progress. In the early Pali Suttas already, when they are discussing about Adimukti or clearly the, when the context requires uh, this, this uh, concept, we see that uh, certainly in many passages, uh, Adimukti is not just uh, faith. It involves clearly and explicitly the aspect of understanding. For, in, for instance, uh, there are places in we speak of uh, Adim, Adimukti, we respect to Nairatmya or Anatta, of no self, of emptiness, of uh, conceit and so on. And as a result, having Adimukti, for instance, on uh, no selfness, one eventually gains the true knowledge, the true jnana or jnana of no self. So the goal is certainly the, the pure insight, the true insight of impermanence or of uh, no selfness. Everybody would agree with me that it is certainly not a matter of intellectual understanding. It is spiritual insight. Huh? It's not just knowledge. It's your seeing directly into reality that this reality there is no self. There's nothing uh, permanent and so on. So these are, these are deep, ultimate, pure insight. But to come to this, often you see uh, passages stating that that traditional first gain Adimukti into no selfness, into impermanence. So clearly in this context, Adimukti is not a matter of just faith. It's uh, a certain degree of insight, a very strong degree of insight that eventually bring you to the true realization of that insight. And uh, another related point I have made in my lecture is that uh, from this perspective, we, we should observe the connection between uh, not only faith and Adimukti, but also a word called Shanti, Kanti, and another word called Ruchi. You see? Shanti hai chung man yo yan, yan, ruchi hai yun lo, or chai hai yuk lo. Shanti is a rin, the is a rin, chung man yo rin. Ruchi is le, yu le, yu nian de yu. These terms are often used, just opposed, with Adimukti or Adimuksha. Now, as to, for instance, the word Shanti also now requires uh, proper understanding in modern time. It's not, the word itself, of course, means, uh, literally, can be translated as endurance, you know, patience, and uh, we have seen that kind of uh, translations, uh, and uh, in many contexts is correct, but it has a very, very important uh, connotation that is missed by many modern exponents, that is the connotation of insight. 
Shanti is also a form of insight, just like Adimukti. It's a kind of a prelude to true, pure insight. So one has Kanti first, and then the true Jnana. Shanti come first, is a prelude to Jnana, to true knowledge. And in similar, term, in similar ways, uh, Atimukti is explained like this. As I already said, first you have an impure or relative form of insight. You could call it a preliminary insight, but it's, it's already much more than just uh, mere intellectual insight, mere kind of book knowledge, understanding. Uh, it's the insight that uh, motivates you, that makes you involved emotionally. And so that kind of same kind of insight like in psychology when the psychotherapist uh, say that uh, a patient must have deep insight in that sense that is so strong that he or she is motivated that I must change, I must, I cannot, I cannot be like this. You ultimately change. So in a way it has uh, much significance even in uh, Buddhist teaching of uh, morality also. Morality is not a question of uh, conforming to, uh, you know, uh, conventional uh, requirements. You know, this society say this is no good, that is good, this is proper, that is not proper, or my religion says that I cannot do this, I can do this, you know, in a legalistic way. So uh, definitely in Buddhism this is not the case. So I have said that the person is truly more in the Buddhist sense when a certain behavior is from the depth of his or her heart, as it were. You cannot help wanting to behave in a certain way and knowing that if I, if I behave in this way, it's good for me, it's good for others, it's good for my spiritual welfare, it's good for the welfare of sentient beings. When you are so convinced, so deeply motivated, you simply want to behave in that way, or simply do not want to behave in another way. So, uh, therefore, in that sense, moral behavior is not uh, something external in Buddhism. It's not a matter of conforming to a set of rules, a set of sikkapadani, uh, and so on, you see. <coughs> and it involves an inner psychological uh, element of deep conviction, of deep commitment. It is in that way that we, we speak of the Dhamma as being creative, that is transformational. It transforms us naturally. Uh, we see in the suttas that a disciple uh, or a listener to the Buddha becomes so inspired, so convinced that he simply cannot help changing himself in a positive way. Even so deeply convinced that ultimately he simply cannot help changing his whole life to the extent of even renouncing his lay life. So you see that in all this process of behavior, what we call moral behavior, what we call wholesome behavior, it's not a question of intellectual decision. Of course, it, 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 intellectual is useful, certainly. We cannot exclude them, and, and you know, at uh, various stages. But fundamentally, 
is based on the inner factor, psychological factor of deep conviction, deep receptivity, deep commitment. And this sum up the, the role of Adimukti. It's this kind of deep conviction, deep, deep uh, commitment that makes us progress spiritually. If we, are, if we are coming back to that kind of sutta, we speak of uh, Adimukti, say, with respect to uh, no self, and then with that you, you gain the uh, pure insight later. It means that you must go through that stage. First you understand, you listen to the Buddha's teaching. Oh yes, all the arguments the Buddha is trying to uh, show us, uh, 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 make me understand that uh, there is no true self, no substantiality. So you gain spiritual insight. You come to a class, you, you, have, you get a kind of experience, right? You listen to the lecturer, you feel, yeah, it's very reasonable. You know, the lecture notes are good, the, book, the books are good, you know. Uh, but unless your heart is involved in it, you go back and simply sleep. <laughs> and tomorrow you are the same person again, you know. And uh, that's why we don't make progress, we don't change our life, you see. Uh, so that subsequent stage, of uh, inner transformation. Huh? That is what is meant by being creative also, you see. Because creative, because it is not, it's not something reactive based on some requirement, commandment on you, expectation on you, you know, not because of legalistic consideration, mechanical consideration, that's why it's creative. It comes spontaneously, you just want to. You simply want to uh, change or you want to align in that particular way. I speak of uh, sila as a kind of alignment, ethical alignment in that sense. So uh, you can see that Adimukti, much like Shanti, represents a psychological and spiritual inner receptivity in you, a very, very deep one, but it is not merely an emotional factor. It involves a certain extent of at least, you might call it preliminary insight. It is an expect of insight in Adibukti, expect of understanding, even expect of, uh, of partial uh, spiritual realization. Eh? Uh, are not emphasized in the discussion and notion of Adimu. That, that Those are the things I wanted to bring out in my lecture. In Mahayana Buddhism, of course, uh, Adimukti is even more emphasized. Again, unfortunately, in modern translations, you see, they say, you begin with faith. Someone has faith. Uh, in prajna paramita or in, in emptiness, and then he he begins to path. But we have to understand once again that it's much more than just faith. He has a very very deep conviction that is certainly not just blind faith, or not just a a kind of lewd uh, emotional response. A very very deep, uh, motivating, inspiring that inspiration within his heart or her heart that makes him go on to the next stage and finally realize emptiness. That aspect is actually very much emphasized in the Sanskrit text and the, and the Chinese text, of course, a, except in Chinese text because of translation sometimes the idea of faith is, I think, too much, uh, stands out too much. So much so that the, the, the idea or the aspect of uh, insight and understanding uh, comes to be diluted.
Another important point I made is uh, that actually, when we understand the importance of insight in this sense, hmm, uh, in the sense of Adimukti, uh, we can see why meditation is, firstly, meditation is so important. Uh, why the, the, the concept of Adimukti developed first in the context of meditation. Actually, that's where it developed. You know, uh, you know, uh, in, in for, for example, the meditation, me, uh, actually every meditation requires Adimukti. You know, like, the, a clear example is visualization. Eh? You can't have visualization, you can't succeed. We That's a very, very important uh, factor. Uh, so the concept started in the context of meditation. Someone meditates, uh, say, on uh, impurities and sees a corpse decomposing at the symmetry. Then he, he goes on through Adimukti. He gains uh, insightful vision that finally all beings throughout the whole universe are nothing but skeletons. So when he can gain that insight, he simply, his whole personality transforms in such a way that there is no more sensual desire for him, for anybody. Because they, everybody is to him truly experienced as a skeleton. So what is there to be attached to? Hmm? Likewise, uh, he, he can meditate on a uh, meditation object like water or like fire, a small, starting with a small frame or starting with a bowl of water, then through Adimukti he is able to expand this vision and experience that the whole universe everywhere is nothing but water or is nothing but uh, fire and so on. Likewise, even in uh, Metta Bhavana, I tell you that ultimately you can expand it. You feel that the whole universe, there's nothing but Metta. If you come to that, it's a very profound state of Adimukti. And you truly want to be kind to yourself, your dearest person, even your enemies, and finally, not anybody in particular, but universal truly unconditional love and kindness to all sentient beings. That requires Adimukti. All these are practice Adimukti. That's why Adimukti begin in the context of meditation. This is my belief. And uh, suddenly you can see this in the Buddhist teachings starting from early Buddhism. The same thing continue in other traditions. Then Already in the early suttas, it is explained that actually Adimukti conditions a person's, uh, Adimukti practice conditions a person's rebirth state. If you, if you practice a meditation, or, uh, then you have the resolve. Now I'm translating the word uh, Adimukti as resolve now, deep conviction, resolve of, say, light a spot of our light or a great amount of light, then correspondingly when you die you will be reborn in the heaven of radiance. 
either of small radians, if that is your practice, or great radians, if you practice on uh, visualization of great radians. So in that way, uh, Tibetan uh, visualization become very, very meaningful also. You see? Uh, it's not a matter of just uh, uh, superficial imagination. It's a process to learn to really, that's, that, that's where the importance of, special importance of imagination comes in. You see? In fact, you have to learn to imagine in a truly special way. There should be an important aspect, important emphasis of uh, of uh, uh, Buddhist practice. If we, if we visualize the Avalokiteshvara and compassion, and you finally really, really through, now I'm using the word Adimukti, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 usually uh, the descriptions do not explicitly use that term, but you can see that it's Adimukti that's at work. Finally, you feel becoming one with Avalokiteshvara. So that means you are becoming compassion per se or Tara, who is the quintessence of Karuna, of compassion. And if you can do that, all you experience is universal compassion. That you can, you, you really com you can feel that as the, the f your, 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 your innermost your, your most fundamental nature of as a human being, as a sentient being. <coughs> so you can see that if you can develop this aspect, how spiritually conducive, helpful, important, uh, meditate, uh, uh, Adimukti experiences. And you certainly cannot do that without Adimukti. Uh, so coming back to this uh, point about Adimukti as a conditioning factor of rebirth, that is also not much emphasized. We see that very clearly already in the Pali Suttas. Accordingly, 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 <laughs> as the as the Adimukti in your meditative experience you are reborn. And I put it out that, you know, in the Pali Abhidhamma text, in the Vibhanga, we have very interesting uh, description in the, in the standard description of, uh, you know, the 12 Nidana, starting from Avicca, uh, Avicca, Pachaya, right? Sankara, right? And then Sankara Pachaya, Vinyana, and so on. It goes like that, right? So, starting from ignorance, conditioned by ignorance, there comes to be conditioning forces called Sankara. And conditioned by Sankara or with Sankara as the conditions, we have consciousness and so on. It goes like that, you see? And then you come to Tanha. Conditioned by Tanha, usually what is the next one? You have Upadana. Tanha, Upadana. From Upadana you have Bhava. Then you get caught, uh, again you are in the, trapped in the cycle of rebirth, Sangsara. Bhava means becoming. Then you'll be born, then you suffer dukkha, you experience dukkha in, 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 in this life, and finally you, you, you grow old, you die, again you are born. <laughs> you see, it goes round and round like that. So, at that juncture, uh, when we are conditioned by craving, there's tanha, trishna and sanskrit, eh? 
uh, when tanha is intensified, becomes grasping. So it's a very powerful force, clinging, grasping. That's called Vardhana. And when you come to that intensified, uh, different state of craving or attachment or clinging, then you are conditioned to be reborn. That's how we get trapped. Now, in the Vibhanga, there's a very interesting uh, description uh, repeated in various contexts. Uh, for instance, in the description of uh, Akusa, the arising of Kusala Chitta and then Akusala Chitta and so on, you see. Uh, that the description that uh, conditioned by Tanha, then the next is Adimukha. Conditioned by Adimukha, your Bhava. How interesting. So Adimukha comes to replace Upadana in that, in that formula. So what does it mean? Of course, unfortunately, that text doesn't explain very much. And I look into the commentary of the Vibhanga, also it doesn't give that much insight. Hardly any, uh, uh, you know, substantial elaboration. But the, I think the point is clear. That uh, Adimukta determines your bhava. The whole problem comes with Tanna, of course. But you see now, Tanna itself is not uh, a kind of intellectual uh, Tanna is craving, uh, by the way, not not the intellectual factor. It's very deep rooted, you know, uh, craving within all all human beings, we, and we have to recognize that we all have it. Except that most of the uh, most of the time, most people are hypocritical. If we face it. You all have it. There's nothing to uh, to shy away from, and uh, we can't say, "Oh, we are not like that." Other people are like that. It's just that your tanna may operate in a different way, different mode. That's all. You see, you have tanna, you have craving towards something. Another person has tanna towards another thing. That's human. If you like human problem, human predicament. So. Tanna is explained as, uh, therefore, the, the, the root cause of uh, Dukkha in Buddhism. So, our whole sentient, our whole human existence is conditioned, is characterized by Tanha until we come to higher and higher states of attainment and finally transcend Tana. And according to this formula, conditioned by Tana craving, we have Adimukha. You see, we have Adimukha. So that Adimukha, you can see the function there. And certainly it's a very, very uh, deep psychological or spiritual factor. And of course it's not just uh, in the description of uh, of of uh, of uh, unwholesome thought in other states, other other situations, you know, in the case of wholesome thought also yes, same kind of description. Anyway, so you have Adimukha then that Adimukha conditions Bhava. Then Bhava conditions Jati and so on, Jati Marana. It's a very, very interesting uh, development. In in brief, it, it suggests that the Atimukha is a very deep and uh, universal experience in us because we all have impure thoughts, all have impure uh, mentality. And as I said, we have to simply accept it. We all have Tanna, for instance. Huh? Um, it's not just, uh, what I'm trying to say, it's not just Adimukha or Adimukti, it's not just kind of a occasional, you know, uh, casual 
experience that some people might have, others might not have. Now this time not just in the context of meditation, not only the meditators have, only those who do asubha, meditation have, not like that. According to this formula, this applies to our existence, for everybody. That's a very interesting point, you know. And I wish the Theravada uh, Abhidhamma tradition elaborates on it, but I couldn't find so far. But when you come to uh, northern sources also, you what I have said just now are all in the Chinese text. In the Agamas, I have given parallel passages. In the uh, Abhidhamma text of the Srivastivada, in the Sanskrit, in the Mahayana, you know, about Adimukti. And the idea of, uh, of uh, Adimukti as a condition for rebirth is even more explicit and clearer in the Abhidhamma tradition of the Northern tradition, that is, Srivastivada and others. And uh, besides uh, uh, serving as as a, as an important factor, necessary factor for 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 rebirth, is in the in the northern tradition is also explained or elaborated as a factor that determines in a very very fundamental way the way we experience reality. There are so many things I have to say, but I can't repeat that lecture. So I just uh, concentrate just on a few points. So this will be the final part I want to talk about. Uh, at least uh, uh, this Sunday. Now, uh, Adimukti determines what we experience as reality. That's very, very important. You know, uh, we think that if we hit the ground, the ground hurts our hand and then we know the ground is real, right? Okay? <laughs> Otherwise, we know that it's a dream. <laughs> when we wake up, then our, our, that's nothing has happened to our hand, then it, you know, it has been a dream. So we say that the dream is not real, then the, the time when I'm now hitting the ground is real. Okay? So what you experience in front of you so convincingly is what you take to be reality. But we really have to begin as Buddhists to question. Of course this questioning is not just confined to Buddhists. Uh, in the West also, East and West, in ancient time, uh, philosophers and spirit teachers begin to question you know, the nature of so-called reality as a claim to be experienced by human beings. Are we really experiencing things truly as they are? Well, suddenly, you know, in Buddhism it says that we, no, we, 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 we do not. Except that maybe in early Buddhism, it is not so explicit that, uh, that it is the Adimukti factor, if you say, in the context of what we have been discussing that determines what we experience as reality. Uh, on the other hand, in the northern sources, starting from Abhidharma, this point is made very, very, very clear. Already, of course, in early Buddhism, we know that, uh, I've already said, uh, the Buddha has told us that uh, we don't really experience reality through reality, it is Yatha Buddha. You see, uh, we need to achieve what is called yata putang jnana, uh, uh, knowledge, that the insight, in fact, is wisdom, into things truly as they are. We don't, we, we experience them according to our conditioning of craving, hatred, ignorance. Because of our craving, we see something, somebody as being very attractive. Because of our hatred, we see somebody or something as being very hateful, right? And uh, that is that, that that is very clearly emphasized in early Buddhism. So to sum up, then the, the so-called reality is actually is actually uh, all conditioned, is experienced conditioned by very deep 
very deep fundamental factors, psychological factors. Uh, summarized as craving, hatred, ignorance. I need not really elaborate on this point because it, it is well understood. Now, uh, when you come to the early yoga chara, it's so interesting. They actually said that uh, all forms of realities we experience uh, as our, I'm talking about ordinary human beings, yeah? an enlightened person, are actually based on Atimukti. It's an Atimukti experience. Uh, in, the, uh, in the chapter uh, called the Tattva Artha, Sansa Yipan, that is in uh, the Yogacara Bhumi, uh, in the Maoli Bumi section, the Bunde Fan gets in the Yipan. Bunde Fan Jai, you can't see the Joy Kuba Bufan. We see the very early Yoga Chara, uh, Sansa Yipan, uh, Bundei Fan Jai, you can't see the Joy Kuba Bufan. Masters explaining what reality is. And it speaks of different types of or different levels of realities. Finally, of course, it is reality in the in the deepest and truest sense. That is a reality that is not even accessible to us, but accessible only to the sages, to the liberated have overcome the twofold hindrances of defilements. You see, defilements hinder us. The way we experience things is all because of the way we are conditioned by defilement. That is recognized and uh, beautifully emphasized in Mahayana. Um, even before Mahayana, beautifully emphasized in the Abhidhamma, particularly in the Northern Abhidhamma. Right? Then you have the other type of hindrance that conditions the way we experience, uh, that we experience things, we experience reality. That's called the hindrance of the knowable. Jneya, Avarana. Sorry, so it's all, Fa no jung, so gyo, so chi jung, that's what you do. Kum chan chan ka chui chung ka ka chan sa chi le hai. Lang kao. So this is this is the insight, not uh, that insight uh, in which the two four hindrances are completely purged and uh, overcome, and uh, you know through insight, uh, perfect insight is achieved. Uh, is the attainment of the very advanced, you will like, Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas. Right? So according to that, is restriction. This is the fourth type of uh, reality. The reality accessible only to such a purifying mind. Okay? So again, I don't want to give you too much detail. So I'm coming back to the first the first is very interesting. The first is said to be uh, reality as established in the world. The world means you, you and me, ordinary people. So we think this is water, that is metal, this is a, a bowl, that is a, a kettle, you know, this is a human, this is an animal, this is a female, this is a male. How interesting. Huh? All this way of perception. This is good, that's bad. At least of all these experiences you find in that section of description in the uh, earliest part, in one of the earliest part of the Yogacara tradition. Whole list. Go into it and you'll see what I mean, you see. Uh, so it includes uh, only objects, uh, includes whole, whole question, whole idea of masculinity, femininity, 
whole idea of uh, you know uh, good bad etc uh, etc et now all these so-called reality real experiences according to the text is based on Adi Mukti. That's a very important word. Adi Mukti that has been passed down to us from beginningless time. So in our samsaric experiences, uh, uh, existence, we accumulate conditioning uh, in, like in the form of, now under the concept of Adi Mukti. So here you can Explain Adi Mukti as, a, as, as, as conditioning, you see. So we have been conditioned collectively. The thing is not just one person, but collectively. Right? To come to, to have a samatha, has a commonness, uh, has, a, has a, a parity you know, in our seeing, a darshana samatha. The way we see things, you experience things, uh, commonly follow a pattern. That pattern we cannot help having because that pattern is conditioned since beginningless time. When you see a person, we think that person is a male, is a person a female, and something is good, something is bad, something is pleasurable, something is unpleasurable. We, all the experiences are absolutely deep rooted from beginningless time. And that is called Adi Mukti. That's interesting. That means that the world of experience that we have actually is the world of Adi Mukti. And we often never reflect so deeply. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, the, that tradition goes on to 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 emphasize Adi Mukti in various ways and finally to use it as a proof of their central doctrine that actually the world we experience is nothing but our consciousness, our cognition, right? We think things are so real but actually it's like we are in a dream. Well in a dream also it's true, you know, in a dream we think everything is very real. We cry, we hate, we love, and you know, and uh, we are compassionate, and we kill, and we fight, all in the dreams. Huh? Then we wake up and we realize, oh, it has been a dream. But until we wake up, everything is so real. So, um, according to the later Yogacharas, when they develop into what we may call uh, idealist, at least in a certain definite sense, uh, we don't want to go into that issue today. Um, they have the important doctrine, the central doctrine that the whole world, the whole universe, the totality of what we experience, reality, is actually. Uh, Nothing but cognition, nothing but consciousness. You might even say that. Yes, it. I was sick. 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 But that idea is called Vijati Matrata. Right? Now, I was saying that in later stages of Yogacara development, the Adimukti. Uh, concept be used even as a proof of this doctrine. So your God Chara Master say, look, if you accept as a Buddhist that different meditation masters can have different uh, types of reality experienced by by them in the particular meditation. Do you understand what I mean? If a meditator meditates, everything is skeleton. He truly is convinced. He truly experiences. Yes. As, 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 as skeletons, hmm? or he truly sees everywhere as water or as fire. Now that has been, that has been uh, teaching since early Buddhism, very, very early Buddhism, a stage of Buddhism. 
if you as a Buddhist accept that, then there's no reason why you can accept at least the possibility that the so-called reality that we experience actually is just a certain type of experience, right? Much like the med different meditators having different ex experiences, eh? so it's uh, the type of experience that we commonly experience because of our conditioning, because of our con perf perfuming, if you like, because of the the the, the operation of the the manifestation of the the inner uh, potential energies of conditioning called bija, called seeds, coming out. So the world of experience is a world of Vinyapti Matrata. And now we can say that they are almost saying, I can't say that they are fully saying that, they are almost saying that actually the world of Vinyapti Matrata is the world of Adimukti. So that goes back to one uh, example I have quoted many times in my Chinese lecture here also, uh, in the public lecture, that you know, uh, many years ago, uh, when I was, uh, when, 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 when these people were very young, uh, and, uh, <laughs> in Colombo, uh, I allowed them to uh, Watch some healthy cities uh, once a week or something like that, and I select them, mm. either educational or something that uh, that they are, they are not harmful, uh, you know, psychologically and so on. Now, to cut the story short, one city that we saw, I think, uh, was entitled the Six Sen, the Six Sen, Telokam, Yo Telokam, right? So in that story, there was a young boy who was able to see ghosts, yeah? And one very interesting, the ghosts that people don't see, but for him is reality, it's, it's something normal. He sees everywhere ghosts, you know? <laughs> and uh, so the mother behind the child doesn't know, doesn't realize that, that he is seeing the ghost, you know? Uh, a traffic jam, for instance, huh? uh, but uh, you know uh, the mother doesn't see. Yeah, a another very interesting uh, case is that a man was murdered. He was mu he was murdered uh, suddenly. He was shot and he he died. So he didn't know that he died actually. He didn't know he died, and then. Uh, he experienced that he continued to live on, you see? All kinds of very real experiences. Meeting his wife, having meals with his wife, and you know, going back to his house and like that, and talking to that boy also. The boy, however, knew that, no, 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 you, you, you are dead. You are not a human being. Finally, the boy told him, and suddenly he got an insight. It's like suddenly, <laughs> you might even say a Zen master slept a, a practitioner and he becomes enlightened. <laughs> it's almost like that. So uh, he realized that suddenly, actually, yes, he remembered the experience. He was murdered and he died. So interesting. Then I, I was so impressed that this, 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 this story is so Yogachara, <laughs> so Yati Matrata. <laughs> Then the boy says something that uh, sticks in my mind, he says, profoundly. Uh, we see what we want to see. We see what we want to see. Tell them, what is all king and what is young king here? They So we see what we want to see. If you truly want to see ghosts, you can see ghosts. <laughs> Maybe not get into that kind of controversy, but uh, but at least uh, 
you know that that remark, that statement by that child who is supposed to have the sixth sense, uh, sums up, you know, in, in a way, uh, uh, illustrate the point I was trying to make about Adimukti. The world of experience, the world of Adimukti. You want to see that is your Adimukti. You are fully convinced. So, uh, this uh, discussion should at least uh, make us more aware that our condition, our, our experiences are conditioned. And uh, we can't be so attached to our condition, uh, our experiences. Uh, if, we get, if we have insight that in fact uh, we, we, we experience all these experiences uh, in a way that we have been very, very deeply not only, not only psychologically. I'm not just talking about uh, superficial psychology. And you know, people say you experience things because of your experience as a child, so-called child experience. It's much more than that. It is from beginningless time. You like in a psychological sense, in a in in a in a in a in a, in a spiritual sense. Yeah? We have been so deeply conditioned. Yeah? conditioned by our karma, conditioned by all our past experiences. So we come to experience and react in a certain way. And we often we argue with ourselves, rationally, ah, I'm like that, I do like this, and I see like this, uh, this must be the correct way. Because of this, because of that, you, we, you give reasons to yourself. You rationalize. But uh, often, we have to be aware that actually there is deep, attachment, like upadana, like tanha coming to upadana, conditioning upadana, tanha conditioning adimukha, adimukha conditions our existence. If we can gain true insight at that, I think we can be free from uh, of all, all so-called psychological problems. Problem is that we can't, right? We can only succeed partially. But at least that should be the direction of our our struggle. And for that, right, the 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 hint I'm making is that we must meditate. If Adimukti is so fundamental, human experience, that conditioning is so fundamental, so deep rooted you can't just, after listening to me today for one hour, you can't change yourself. I can't expect to change myself either, you know, unless you meditate, unless you meditate. Because you, only when you meditate that you come to deep levels of your consciousness. The things operate, function at subtle, very subtle and very, very deep levels and then powerful enough to give an insight, insight that we often don't even label uh, conceptually, don't label uh, verbally, is it? But we gain the insight, a very convincing insight, we, we change. For instance, one insight is universal love, for instance, you, you don't matter about that. You really gain insight that all beings are to be cared, to be loved by you, just like you love yourself and your, your mother. You know what Dukkha is as a human being in this meditation. And you realize that all sentient beings actually are experiencing Dukkha. And the deep conviction that this uh, universal love is innate in you as a human being and innate in everybody. And it is, if you like, in the whole universe. And something that we can, something so important, uh, which we can develop, suddenly develop systematically in meditation. Something that makes our life fully, completely meaningful. So when you do say, uh, mindfulness breathing also, I, I, I guide you, I, I teach you, 
to use that to come to realize impermanence, to come to realize reality, to come to realize even oneness. All these things can happen only in meditation. Not in words, not in lectures, not in talks, not in the books. That is why meditation is so important. And that is also why, at least, this is also one reason why uh, meditation is represented by, by the word bhavana. I told you last week. Bhana means sauham. Make your sauham. Can some of that touch all? Motazo is a mosaha, or you can bong. Motazo is a chantan nikon, my chantan nikon kapola. So it's that important. So uh, we said, uh, I, we practice Buddhism, we practice the Dhamma, you know, we are follower the Buddha. It doesn't mean we are clever in understanding Patisasam Mapada or Four Noble Truths or all these doctrines. Huh? Or we donate a lot of money to a Buddhist center. What it essentially means is that if we, if, we, if we practice meditation according to the Buddha's teaching, then you are Buddhist. That, that, that word practice becomes a word for also meditation. Well, I think uh, today we have spoken a lot. We will have to stop in a 